In this episode of Mind Pump, so this is a qua episode. This is where we answer fitness questions asked by listeners like you. So questions if you wanna, and answers. If you want to ask us a fitness question, go to our Mind Pump page uh, on Instagram, Mind Pump Media page, um, and post your question underneath the meme that says qua. Now, qua is just us pronouncing the word Q and A, and we'll pick our favorite questions and we'll answer them. But We're the way, so clever. but the way we open this episode is by talking about current events our lives. Every once in a while, we mention our sponsors. So here's what we talked about in this episode. We open up by talking about our family time in Lake Tahoe. All of us took a 10-day vacation up in Lake Tahoe, brought our families, had a lot of fun. So we talked about all the shenanigans. And we're still friends. Adam talked about how Everett, uh, this is uh, Justin's son, acts just like him uh, in good and bad ways. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. <laughs> I talked about how Adam uh, got his butt kicked by his uh, 12-year-old nephew at video games. Oh, and snap. He's still uh, angry about it. I can, I'm looking at his face right now. I didn't like that. Uh, we talked about Justin's snowboarding accident. Thank God. He, he has a head like Bonk's adventure. For you old people, you know that video game is like... <laughs> We talked yeah, about thick dome. We talked about our holiday fat gain and why we right now don't really reflect uh, the fitness space too well. Um, and we talked about how we're getting out of that. Mm. I talked about the value of ATP. ATP is one of the main sources of cellular energy in your body. And I talked about its benefits, why you want to make more of it, and ways you can boost it. Now, one way you can actually boost your your cellular production of ATP and get its anti aging or uh, rejuvenating effects is to do red light therapy. Um, now, our favorite company uh, that produces the best red lights uh, in the industry is Juve, um, J-O-O-V. Now, this is a company that makes these red light panels. You put them on your body. They actually reduce, this is clinically proven, reduce the appearance of wrinkles, can regrow hair, and produce more ATPs overall in your body for faster recovery and lower inflammation. If you want to learn more or use the Mind Pump discount, here's what you do. Go to juve.com, J-O-O-V-V.com forward slash mind pump. You're going to get a free MAPS Prime program with the purchase of $500 or more, and you'll get free shipping. Then we talked about the cartoon Wall-E and its predictions and how they're coming true. It's kind of scary. Yeah, it's sad. I talked about the awesome but weird show that I watched uh, recently, Shen Yun. It's in the Bay Area right now. It's kind of strange. Uh, I talked about the cannabinoid cannabichromine, that's CBC, its effects on the body, how it helps the body regulate its own production of natural cannabinoids like anandamide and what that means for you. Now, one of the greatest sources of CBD is in full spectrum hemp oil extracts and our favorite company that produces some of the best sources you'll find is Ned. Now, if you want to use the Mind Pump discount, here's what you do. Go to Hello Ned. that's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com forward slash Mind Pump and you'll get 15% off your first purchase. And then we mentioned one of our favorite comedians of all time, Ricky Gervais, and how he roasted all of I Hollywood. I love it. At the uh, recent, what was it, the Golden Globes? Yeah. Uh, oh, that was great. Everybody was watching it, of course. Now, that was the intro portion. Then we got into the fitness question. So the first question was, why is it so hard for people to stick to their health and fitness goals? So obviously, it's January. It's the beginning of a new decade, a new year. A lot of you are reinvigorated and motivated to work out. Uh, maybe you've tried this in the past and didn't succeed. You'll definitely want to listen to that portion of the episode. The next question, what are the benefits of isometric holds? Now, isometric holds are not when you're curling or lowering a weight, but rather while you, when you hold a weight and tense up. Are there benefits to that? And if there are benefits, how can you apply that to your current workout? The next question, this person wants to know why fit people have a lower resting heart rate. So you may be noticing that if you're working out, your heart rate beats less and less at rest. What does that mean? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And the final question, this person wants to know if inner thigh workouts are bad for men. So we talk about all you know, inner thigh exercises, the benefits, how to apply inner thigh exercises to your routine. Thigh master. Also, this month, of course, being January, lots of people are getting into fitness. The number one goal is fat loss, right? It's, it's hands down. People who get started in January, actually, who people get started any time of the year, but especially in January, number one goal is how do I burn body fat the most effective way? So we decided to put our most effective fat burning program on sale at 50% off. Now, all of our programs will help your body burn more calories, will help you burn more body fat. But one program in particular, especially in terms of short-term fat loss, in other words, you want fast results now, uh, is our MAPS HIT program. Now, HIT is spelled H-I-I-T. That stands for 
high intensity interval training. Now, studies show that high intensity interval training burns more body fat in more effective ways and has a more profound beneficial impact on your metabolism than other forms of fat burning type workouts. So what we did is we designed a HIIT program properly. We programmed it with resistance training. We did it in levels so you can progress yourself. We planned it all out for you. There's exercise demos in the program. So once you get the program, you get the whole workout. You can click on an exercise and you can watch how to do it properly, determine your current fitness level, and proceed accordingly. Again, MAPS HIT, the most effective fat burning program that we have. It's 50% off right now. Here's how you get that 50% off discount. Go to mapshit.com. So that's M-A-P-S-H-I-I-T.com and use the code HIT50. That's H-I-I-T-5-0, no space, for the discount. And it's t-shirt time. Ah, shit, Doug, you know it's my favorite time of the week. Woo-wee. Get them. All right, we had a ton of reviews coming in over the holidays. We have five winners for iTunes and four winners for Facebook. The iTunes winners are Beyond Mel, S. Folden, Ace of Spades, Finney Mac, Rosie2509, for Facebook, Ronnie Flynn, Sarah Cooper, Tori Weiss, Dan James. All of you are winners. Send the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Include your shirt size, your shipping address, and we'll get that shirt right out to you. For me, what I really appreciate about, about it, because now I've traveled with um, uh, Brianna and uh, Justin's kids uh, now several times. And they're getting comfortable with me. Like at first, when we first did mm-hmm. the first trip, I'd go up to, you know, uh, Justin's boys and I'd hug them. And, you know, kids at first kind of like, eh, who's yeah. this guy trying to yell yeah. But now they give me a hug back and we mess around. And I had a great talk with, I took Brianna to breakfast, uh, like one of the last days I was there. And we're talking about, you know, working hard and success and school and all that kind of stuff. And we had a really good, and so for me, being able to connect with your kids and then watching our kids connect. Yeah. Uh, there was a couple times where, oh, this is what it was. We went to go eat at uh, that, that breakfast place in Truckee, Squeeze In. Mm-hmm. Love that place, by the way. Yeah. Love that place. So we go in there, and you know how there's writing on the walls and on the tables? Yeah. <clears throat> and you can grab uh, Sharpie pens and do that? So the kids were like, we got to write Mind Pump everywhere. We got to write Mind Pump family. And so I can see now that the kids are starting to oh, that's cool. come together and also be like, you know, yeah, yeah we're Mind Pump family. We're under the Mind Pump flag. This, yeah. was, this was my first trip with all of your guys' kids, and I felt the same way, too, that I've really got to start to connect more with all of them, yep. more than any mm-hmm. other time. Um, such a great story. So I told on the podcast before, uh, it was a long time ago. We did an episode one time and I think it was a quaw or somehow. And we, we went down the rabbit hole talking about fights that we've gotten in, in our mm-hmm. entire life. Right. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, the last actual like bar fight or adult fight that I had gotten in was, <laughs> was with Justin uh, and not actually not with him. Meaning not my proudest moment. I was with him. <laughs> And this is like over 10 years now. I mean, this is over 10 years ago. And it so was, you're still a full on adult. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're yeah. still in our, what? I know late, way better than to do that. Late 20s, right? <laughs> yeah, like true. way better. We're in our late 20s. Well, here, listen, you got to listen to this story because this it ties into uh, your kids. And it, it was just, it was unreal to me how it unfolded. <laughs> so I have to recap the audience Uh-oh. on this, the old story first so they understand what I saw and went through. So uh, about 10 years ago, maybe give or take a year or two, uh, Justin and I were, were out at a, a bar in uh, San Jose or Los Gatos area called uh, Mount Charlie's. And if you've ever been there, it's yeah. a, a small, very popular place. And it's like, I have to preface this, though. We were at your place before that taking shot after shot after shot. Yeah, you were hammered. Yeah. Was yeah. It, really it was really hammered it was, it was a before drunk, I even got there. Yeah. It was and, the drunkest I've ever seen you. And, yeah, and, it was. And Mountain Charlie's is extremely conducive to fighting. It's right. just Let's a lot of energy there. I, yes. I, I love I, mean? I love how he's prefacing it right now. I have to, dude, because I know you're going to roast listen, me right listen, now. Listen, listen. I was in a bad mood. Hey, we're, <laughs> this is a little uh, edgy. Yeah. This is over 10 years ago. I know. So, I know. so how you do know, you defend your old self? Right. right. You get a pass. You get a yeah. pass. It's over a decade. I think we've all, I think uh, anyone listening knows that they've grown tremendously probably in a decade, right? So oh, yeah. right. anyways, we're we're at the bar and uh, Justin is hammered. And it is. It's at one of those where people are, you know, you're, you're so tight that you're getting bumped into and you're probably spilling drinks on you. It's just a... <laughs> <laughs> and you know it's a it's not it's not the most conducive for uh, dancing. It's just we get there and we're walking through, and I see Justin. He's you know had another he had another shot as soon as we got there, and he's making his way through the crowd. 
And I had a buddy that was like this. He was a, a, a football buddy of mine, a good friend of mine who's a linebacker. And he got the exact same way. And I see this side of Justin come out. And he's walking through the crowd. And he's walking through the crowd. He's like shouldering people on Just purpose. Hard. <laughs> yeah. And I'm watching people like, oh, you know, spill their drinks and shit. <laughs> and sooner or later, you know, Such a dick. he runs into the big guy who isn't going to yeah. just take that and then it's on you know yeah. here we go we're fucking brawling and so i see a guy throw a punch at justin i come behind him and fucking choke hold him and you know we get kicked out and everything so the reason why i'm telling that story is i have this moment we're sitting in the tahoe house and i'm, I'm sitting by the fire and I, I'm, I'm having i think hot cocoa i'm drinking and i'm watching uh uh, Justin's two kids, right? Everett and Ethan. Now, Everett's the little boy, and Everett is the one who uh, you've probably heard Justin reference as he's like a mini version of Justin. Totally. But he's the mm-hmm. he's the younger one. He's at what three years younger? Three. Three years mm-hmm. younger, right? So he's he's a little bit he's quite a bit smaller, although he's he's catching up. And Ethan is more like his his mom. He's a he's a big reader. He's a little more quiet. He's a lover. He's just yeah. he's not like as physical as as Everett is. And I saw this expression many times while we were all together. But one in particular that brought up this story. And I'm sitting at the fire. Everett's kind of near me, and he's kind of minding his own business plan. And Ethan comes walking from the kitchen, and Ethan's kind of minding his own business. And Everett gets up, and he starts to walk towards the kitchen where Ethan's coming from. And as he gets closer to him, I swear I can see Justin's swagger, the same way Justin's walking. <laughs> Dude. And he just fucking throws a shoulder into Ethan for no reason. And then, does that, dude. And then Ethan, All like, time. you know, Ethan gets, like, set back a he's little like, bit. What are you doing? Looks down at him, and then Everett just looks at him and grins. Like, what are you going to do? You know what I'm saying? And he just paid no attention to him and they moved it. And I went, oh my God, was that Justin to a T? Yeah. And I died. He's testing them. Oh. You know, it's like, that was like half the thing. It's like, if you have an older brother, you're just always testing your abilities. Like, can I take him at any moment? You know, <laughs> you just always want to attack. Strong genetics. Yeah. So Strong I genetics. I had a really, a really good time. I like, there was one part that made me laugh where I think it was, was it your nephew who brought the, the PlayStation? Oh yeah, and he had, Nathaniel. Yeah, and Nathan, he had video games set up or whatever, mm-hmm. and he asks, you know, Uncle Adam, he's like, "Hey, let's play Madden." And I, we've heard Adam talk about how awesome he is at, at Madden, <laughs> at least I don't know, fifteen times. If you've listened to the show for a long time, you know what I'm talking about. Adam talks about how good he is at Madden, so he sits down to play. And how old is he? He's uh, what, 11, 12? Yeah, eleven or twelve. Twelve. Yeah. So they sit down to play, and they start talking shit to each other, <laughs> mm. and his nephew whoops his ass. <laughs> and Adam is not happy. No, he is not happy about it. Uh, it's one of those young lion, old lion, you know, sure, situations yeah, yeah. where the, the kid <clears throat> beats it. and the amount of shit you were talking. Oh man! And you can see Adam was so frustrated. He about gets, it. He gets oh. me fired. I'm competitive as shit for sure. And <laughs> so you know, uh, we he's. I mean, it's funny to watch the the evolution, right? So of him growing, we obviously I've known him for ten years because Katrina and I have been together that long. And so when he first got into video games, obviously when you play with a kid that's six years old, barely learning the controls and stuff like that, even, and, and at that time I was in the height of still playing like video games yeah. back then. So it was me always whooping on him. And then over the years, he's, he's gotten older and played more and played more and I'm playing less and less. And now it's to a point where I think- Plus these kids are, all, it's a whole new generation. Oh yeah. yeah. Totally. They're just, and their the games <laughs> evolved tremendously. Oh yeah. And that's, and you know, and, and but still in the last couple, because we do this every year, it's tradition that they bring the, one of the consoles up and Uncle Adam still comes down and play. That's the only time I play now. That's on, on the Christmas break when we're all together, they pull the games out. And for the last eight, nine years, I still whoop up on everybody, even though I haven't been playing. Like once I get a game in where I like learn the controls again, like, okay, let me figure this out. Like I end up still whooping on them. Well, this is the first year where he's getting me. You know? <laughs> so you probably saw a little bit of my, Oh, he was gloating about it. Oh yeah. He well, was, you know oh, what? From then on and, out. And here's the thing he, in this, this is the same thing with my kid. He, he, they deserve to talk shit because you were talking hella shit. Oh yeah. yeah and I, I talk hella yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. Like when I play shit with my son, I talk hella shit. So when he wins and he does it back to me and I get angry, I'm like, well, I mean, of course. You know, yeah. He learned this from me. Well, it's proving ground. You yeah. know, like, like once they get one on you, yeah, like, totally is justified to come back at yard. Yeah, one time we were playing that game Rummy Cube that we all played. It's yeah. like a numbers game. That's right? the you one your, to, your son's oh, really good at. Yeah, right? you have to match, you know, patterns and numbers, and he's just a wizard with that kind of stuff. And I remember one time we were playing, it was uh, Jessica, me, and my daughter, and I told my son, I said, come play with us. And he goes, no, I don't want to play, whatever. He'd want to watch TV or something. I'm like, come on. And I forced him. 
I'm like, no, you're gonna sit down and you're gonna play this game with us. And he goes, it's boring. He goes, I'm just gonna, I'm just, I'm, I'm just gonna crush you. It's too boring. Oh, wow. And I was like, <laughs> I'm just oh, gonna crush yeah, you little it's so boring. shit. I'm like, sit down. And I really tried, dude. Oh, and I thought no. to my head, I'm like, if, as soon as I beat him, I'm gonna talk shit for a week. I'm gonna teach him a lesson. But I didn't win. I got my ass kicked. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I told you. And he gets up and walks away. I'm like, oh. I'm so mad. Oh, you know, my God. That so gets funny. Me. That, uh, uh, Justin, uh, uh, I want to know what happened with you on the it was a snowboarding run. Yeah. So we went. Uh, we went skiing. I went snowboarding. Uh, so Courtney, her sister, and then uh, my two boys, I actually signed them up for ski school. And so the whole day they got to learn, uh, you know, under professionals. I was like, oh, thank God, because I didn't want to, like, you know, spend the whole time trying to teach them and everything. I wouldn't even get a run in. So uh, we did that. And then we kind of went off on our own. And I hadn't snowboard, I don't know, maybe in like five, six years, something like that. But I mean, I'm not like a bad snowboarder. I like I'm again. I'm prefacing this all because it was you know a bad thing that happened. So you're making a lot of excuses there. for yourself. I am. <laughs> I am. I'm turning forty this year. You know, yeah. like there's a lot of things happening. The sun was in my eyes. Yeah, so I <laughs> got a bad hip. <laughs> exactly. So we were going on all these runs. I probably went on. I want to say eight runs or so. And I started to get that stupid confidence where I was seeing jumps to the left, to the right. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go test it. And I went off a few jumps. Showing off for his wife. Yeah, because I'm there for my wife and, and her sister. I'm like, you know, you guys got to know I still got it. You know, and so I'm doing my thing. <laughs> and They're uh, pretty good skiers, right? Yeah. Well, Courtney hadn't done it since for like 20 years. So oh, she wow. was really scared. And so we actually started on the bunny slope and everything. But like, she picked it up right away, like riding a bike. So yeah. they were doing fine. And they were like cruising down, like taking their time, doing their thing. And so it was funny because they're like, we could hear you like behind us because like my board and, and my body and everything make a lot of noise yeah. apparently <laughs> uh, as, as I go I'm like, <laughs> like is that yeah. Squatch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no it's just the Yeti's coming for you yeah. uh, and so like this is get like the eighth run or something and we're going towards the top and we're trying to come down to eat lunch and so I'm like crossing over a few trails and so there's this one big trail and I'm, I'm picking up speed like I got like a lot of speed going uh, you know laterally so I'm I start to cut and I'm cutting across and I, I go to like dig my heels in a bit more to, to, to grab an edge and I get nothing. And the board literally kicks right out from under me and the board like goes up over my head. My head is the first thing that slams back, boom, on the back of my head to my neck to then my upper back. And oh. I saw a flash of red and just pain instantly. And then I just laid there just, oh, for like 10 minutes. There was a guy, thankfully, there that was like part of the ski patrol, saw this whole thing happen. He's like, oh, no. He comes up to me and like is trying to ask me all these questions, you know, because obviously. Now, I do you remember that? Whole, do you remember that whole period? Hell hard questions, too. Yeah, no. I What's did. the square root of 499? <laughs> Like, fuck, I wouldn't know that I'm if like, I didn't uh, hit my head. Two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He asked me, like, what the, the, the run I was on, and I didn't even know. So the first question I got wrong, you know? And so he's like, oh, I don't know about that. And, like, started asking me, like, what day it was, like, you know, who I am, my name, and all that. So I'm like, okay. I, I, like, I could answer it, but I was in pain. Like, I was in a lot of pain. Oh, I had, like, a blurry, like, vision. Uh, so anyway, it was a bad, it was a bad fall. Probably the worst I've had in terms of like a head slamming, uh, injury. So I just, of course, you know, dumbass me, like wouldn't take them up on the whole, like, Oh, I'll take you down to the very bottom in the sled, you know? And like, you don't have to do the rest of the run. I'm like, no, nah, I can do it. I'm fine. And so I got up and like mustered like whatever energy I had with a throbbing head, just like going down and like every like, you know, little like imbalancing thing. I freaked out and then was like making my way back. But um, yeah, I was sitting there just just throbbing headache and all that. And then finally just called it a day and went home. Now, did you break the ice with your because, you know, the thing that probably if it was me, I would have died. But <laughs> because your head is made for that, you know, <laughs> it is. Have you ever tried one of his hats on? Yeah, <clears throat> it's a it's a thick dome. You I got, got a thick uh, thick head. Your head, if I put your head on right now, it would fall down to my nose because yeah. you have a big football head. You oh know my what I mean? god! And it's funny because like so, 
So, I mean, that's why you survive. Cause yeah. The, the way it was described to me, if I hit my head like that, I probably... Dude, wouldn't. so, like, all these stories come out later. Like, I'm trying to tell everybody what happened. You know, come back to the house. Everybody's concerned because Courtney, I don't know what she said to everybody what happened, but she scared yeah, We had a list of potential hosts because we're like, what's he going to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh. But, but then there was, like, part of it where... I'm like, am I going to get new powers? You know, like, <laughs> like maybe, what? you know, like, like maybe I'll become a savant, you know, or like, like I'll be able to like see like, like colors and smell them. You yeah. know, like things. <laughs> I've heard weird jet? stories about that, you know, where people have had head trauma. That's actually true. There, there's been, these are like real reports of people who've had head trauma. Mm -hmm. There was one guy who had head trauma, woke up. And was a fucking piano savant. Could yeah. play the piano. Is there a movie about knew, that? Knew a whole nother language too, like like Icelandic. I think I, I read a guy that like woke up and he could speak Icelandic. <laughs> yeah, dude. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. That'd be weird if you've never been to Iceland. That's crazy. Yeah, exactly. What was it? <laughs> Xenoglossy, the ability to speak an unfamiliar language. So it's a real thing, like these real like occurrences. But yeah, dude, I mean And then most people die. And then most people die. <laughs> yeah, most yeah. people just get really bad, yeah, like like brain hemorrhaging uh, things happen and they yeah, they suffer. It's like from comic it. books where they, every you know, every superhero like, you know, jumped in, you know, radioactive liquid or something comes out like, I have superpowers. <laughs> Whereas most people will get cancer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know I mean? yeah. So I get back to the house and everybody has a story about this fall. Like I guess this is a very like uh like I guess a lot of people have fallen this particular way and it, it's caused a lot of issues. Like my brother-in-law was telling me about one of his friends that actually fell like this and was in a coma for two months. Oh, geez. Yeah. It scared the shit out of me. Another guy, like the, the, the guy, the ski patrol guy said the last person he saw fall like that, like split his helmet in half, like broke the whole helmet in half and went to the ER and like, so he's like, you felt just the same exact way as all these people. And you, and now did, were you given the opportunity to wear, did you wear a helmet? And if not, where did they? No, that, okay. And I'm, I'm definitely this new advocate for I helmet. Took, I took him <laughs> snowboarding. I, I took him shopping for yeah. one of I was did like, you? oh, this is so lame, you know? Cause like it, you, <laughs> there is no way to look cool with a helmet. I'm like, wait, not... way to ruin it for me too, dude. Yeah. Everybody, I've been getting shit since I've been posting well, about snowboarding. I'll forever. be your fall guy. Cause apparently I, you know. Know, like it, it it happens and it was totally a freak random thing but i'm like totally an advocate for helmet wearing you don't think you were being an asshole just a tiny bit no not, not this particular bit? part yeah no, no i don't know not I've, at all i feel like you were doing things you shouldn't have been doing on your I, first first day of riding again maybe yeah. try to do a backflip <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, i mean the conditions weren't great they but, were I mean, i'll make i'll make like excuses terrible day to be doing anything anything off the crazy anything yeah. off the trail it was stupid yeah anything it didn't off. snow at all or yeah. barely yeah no, no. it was like ice out there it yeah was there like was those brown patches i was going through so yeah it was stupid well i'm glad you're okay i was a little concerned but you know then when you came out and we talked to you a little bit i was like oh, okay he's, he's yeah, yeah he's okay. too, dude i was so sore the next two three days like my neck like it was super swollen my neck and then like i was so stiff i couldn't even turn left or right like looking now you so was, you've had brutal. you've had concussions from football um do you feel that it was as bad or worse i feel like it was worse oh wow, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah because i mean the other ones like they would go away like i <laughs> it's so bad, dude. You know what the old method was when you got a concussion in football and you're like still trying to play? Like you would pinch like in between your thumb and your pointer finger and you'd pinch as hard as you can to kind of like help suppress the pain. What? And then you'd keep playing. That's what I used to do. <laughs> what? <laughs> and now you know why I can't remember anything. Explain no. so much. Yeah. That's terrible. Like, like the person in the group that needs like more head trauma. I mean, come on. Like, <laughs> well, you could, the guy who could handle it, though, you know, again, I let's guess. be honest, if yeah. any of us fell that way, we probably wouldn't be yeah. here. I yeah. need I need my brain scan. Jeez. Yeah. Anyway, well, I'll tell you what, what else uh, this trip did for me? It 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 was a period. It was a period at the end of the fat days. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Like we I'm were all talking about that. This is the fattest I think we've uh, all been. Yeah, dude, it's I'm done. In a while. Yeah, it's, it's time. It's time yeah. to reverse, re yeah. to hit reverse. Team Tubby, <laughs> we need a, an overhaul. No, I just, I, I that's have, actually what I had such a good time, but I was most excited to get home to get back to like my routine. Like, yeah. I, you know, there's a comes a point where 
I, um, and I don't know. I mean, to me, that's, that's good balance. I mean, we were out for 10 days. That's the longest trip that we've ever taken any of us. And we were eating yeah. just everything, whatever, I know. everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, Bro, I was had, suffering from it too, man. I had, burn was uh, through the roof. Oh dude, I had candy. I had bread. I had pie, a lot of everything. I had waffles, wine like, every dude, day. What am I doing? Oh. So did you guys, uh, for the audience, one of the things we do when we, we go on these trips with the big, we had 22 people in this house and, um, Katrina's family has always done this, and I love this. I, I've I've uh, I've never done this with another another group or family until her family, and uh, I, I love introducing it to other people that that travel in big groups. And that's, you know, you have uh, we pair everybody up, so there's eleven pairs, and you are responsible for one either breakfast or dinner one day. That's it, and that one day you have to you know shop for the food, you pay for it, you cook it, and you clean the kitchen. But what's awesome is you have that one meal. That you go all out on, that and then you, the rest of the week you don't. Have to and worry. then the rest of the week you don't have to worry about anything. Yeah. And the and the kitchen's yeah, always system. kitchen's always clean. You're you're always having a great meal, either breakfast or dinner. Mm-hmm. Like, man, I love doing that, and uh, it's fun because uh, because it's a tradition for the family. Everyone kind of brings it. You know, everybody likes to try and wow everybody for their their meal and stuff. Did you guys have a favorite meal that you guys had during the trip? You know, I thought uh, I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, I'm trying to think. What was my... I loved the the chicken pot pie that uh, Katrina made a oh, lot. Right? right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. In fact, I was going to ask her for, for the recipe. But no, I, I thought that was a great idea. It, it's awesome because everybody kind of eats together. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it was... Now, preparing food for... That was hard. How many people? 22. 22 oh, people. yeah, that was a... Yeah, tricky. That's difficult. You either... Th- Undershoot or way over. Yeah, shoot. to yeah. time everything or whatever. And so I feel like we could have done, you know, because Jessica and I had one night. I feel like we could have done a, a little bit better, but it, it was fun. I was a little stressed out about it because I've never cooked for that many people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, we had fun with it. We put music on, we had some wine, making the food, you know, kind of enjoying, you know, the whole yeah. process. I think you guys missed out the last night because uh, you guys stayed at, at the other place. Yeah. Uh, I, we had uh, I don't know if it was Larry and I forget who else was, was working. Oh, with Larry moment. brings it when he does. That's oh, right. We, man, it was yeah. He had some kind of like uh, spiced chicken and he did all kinds of different like breasts and uh, thighs and and then uh, a zucchini dish and like these potatoes with like this crusted like parmesan and, oh, wow. and everything. Oh, it was like fantastic. Mm, yeah, that was mm. my favorite. Oh, Jerlene's breakfast was mine. The way she does the the poached eggs and then puts them on the. Oh, like, oh, we Hollandaise? missed that. Oh, you missed that? We missed because we went snowboarding that day. Oh, the Hollandaise? I know. Yes. I was pissed. Yeah, that was good. That looked like a like oh. Sunday brunch. Oh, dude. It, she goes, that, that's her son. It's his birthday, right? So uh, it's his birthday. On you New- what, 25? Yeah, on New Year's Eve, right? And so, you know, that was his request. That's his favorite breakfast that his mom makes. And it's, God, it's so good, dude. It was really good. Yeah. I liked what you and Doug did when you guys did the make your own pizza. Oh, yeah, yeah that you know? was good, too. That was, that's fun that was because the kids have fun with that. So yeah. that's what I, you know, I've yeah, been a part of like other that. big groups. And uh, that, uh, it was a, an ex of mine that her family, that was their tradition when they all got together. In fact, they did, that was their Christmas. You know, most people do like a prime rib or a turkey, like a big, but they had so many people that they would do this make your own pizza thing. And I was like, man, the way that works and the the interaction that you get from all the people like making it and laughing, totally. and it's just a mm-hmm. good, fun uh, meal to have. Yeah, it was like the- interactive. It was yeah, fun. Yeah. And I thought Doug and I nailed down, I mean, we were pretty close on just the right amount of everything. I, yeah. thought, I thought we had the least amount of leftovers. We d- I did have to run back to the store and get- It was the, s- the sauce, right? The tomato sauce. Yeah. yeah, we were a little light on the tomatoes. Which It's I think- hard to judge with that many people. It was. Unless you're experienced with, like if my mom was there making food it would have been great because she's cooks for that many people every time or more every time there's a family function yeah i've never done that jessica does never does that for that many people so we're like trying to calculate exactly so we were a little short on a couple things but yeah 22 is a lot that was it was hard for us too i Mm -hmm. mean it's hard to gauge what was great about those uh what do you call those the sausage balls no meatballs meatballs i'm sorry uh but like all this like like vegetables that was snuck in there. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, well, like I found out later, and I was like, "Oh, great!" Because the kids ate them up like crazy. Oh, we filled them up with tons and tons of vegetables. Actually, yeah. that's a that's something that Jessica does really well. She'll make a meat dish or something, and mm. she'll pack it full of vegetables, and the kids will just. I didn't even know that. that. Yeah. Oh, it was full of lots of different vegetables. Oh wow! Like yeah, tons, we ate a bunch of those. Well, tons. I tell you what was great about your meal. I know you were hard on yourself about it because you were a little light on the sauce and and whatever, but. It actually was very refreshing because we were eating a lot of heavy meals and a lot of like, 
you know, fatty and, and carb driven, like to have a meal that f- felt light. Yes. Mm-hmm. Felt yeah. really good. It was good yeah. timing for your guys' meal to hit in around. the middle. Yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was really nice. No, no. It's a, and then there was a f- revealing moment for me that I never, you ever do something with, uh, growing up that you feel you, you kind of, re- you, you think it's a normal thing for everybody cause you grew up with it. But then when you meet with other people, you realize, oh, this is just kind of what we do or whatever. Mm. So, and this might be a cultural thing, but in, in my family, before we eat, um, before the meal starts, somebody will say, you know, like you've heard Bon Appetit, right? You've heard yeah. that before. Mm. Yeah. So my dad would say something in Italian, uh, you know, and, it, you know, he'd say uh, Bon Pranzo is what he would say. It's just a, it just means good, you know, good dinner. And then someone would reply something else and then we would all eat. And it's just, I grew up with before you eat as a family, somebody says something to bring everybody together and yeah. start. So while we're having dinner, we're having dinner every night with everybody. Every night I'm saying, cheers, cheers, everybody, cheers, right? And Jessica's like, I notice you do that every time before dinner. I'm like, oh, yeah, I do. I'm trying to think, like, <laughs> why do I do that? I'm like, oh, it's because the way I grew up is if, when you have a big group, the way you make everybody, rather than everybody kind of eating on their own, mm-hmm. the way you make everybody feel like they're together is you say something out loud and then other people reply. I was actually really surprised, which is also probably why Katrina's mom really enjoyed you guys and you in particular about that, Sal, is that she normally does that. Oh. That's kind of her. So they do the same thing. She normally, like, will say something. Yeah. Real, real, you know, hey, I'm just, I'm so happy to have all of you. I love it. She kind of, and sometimes she'll even go around the table and say something individually about each one of us and, and then we then we eat. Oh, uh, I love that. But I think the only reason why she probably didn't was because we had such a large mixed group uh-huh. that I didn't you know didn't want to impose on anybody else. So it was ironic that you say that, and that was a tradition. Um, I'm sure she would have of uh, loved to continue, keep that going. So yeah. it's something that we'll oh, have to awesome. But I tell do. you what, dude, the the fat days are over. It's, it's <laughs> we got to start looking like a fitness podcast again. You know what I'm saying? Oh man. Yeah. No. I. I, I mean, it was fun. I'm I'm so over it. Like I yesterday I and it what it, what it was is okay. To be honest, it's not that I feel fat. I'm, I'm joking. What it is, I feel, I don't feel good. I feel inflamed. Mm-hmm. My mind didn't feel as sharp. Oh, I got sick, dude. Yeah. We got I haven't, cold. Been, I haven't been sick in over a year and yep. you know, the first week of bad eating, poor sleep. Mm-hmm. It's just an example. Like, well, fuck. so what I did is I'm like, okay. And you know, I've gotten to the point now, it, you guys also, you know, we've been do nutrition and fitness for so long that when I change things up, it's rarely because I want to change my appearance although I'll joke around about that, it's mainly because I, I, I've identified that I'm feeling a particular way. Mm-hmm. So what I'm feeling is foggy-minded. I'm not, I don't have as much energy um, and m- just more stiff and inflamed just in general. Mm-hmm. So I came back and I'm like, okay, I want to go anti-inflammatory. I want to bring back mental sharpness. And for me, and this is for me personal. So if you're listening right now, this may not apply to you, but this is something that I've identified for myself. Uh, fasting always reduces inflammation to me. Now, studies show that it actually does that for a lot of people. Um, but for some of you, that may not be a, a, something that's effective. If you have uh, issues with eating um, or you're doing it for weight loss, it's not a good idea. Um, but for me, it, weight loss was never an issue. It was always weight gain. So fasting was actually a good practice. So fasting reduces inflammation. And then going on a ketogenic type diet. The one thing that I noticed for myself on the at least the short-term effects of ketogenic diet is mental sharpness. So I did a fast and now I'm coming back. I'm going to go keto. Now I know my performance is going to decline in the gym. I know I've already lost water. I'm not going to get as good of a pump, but I'm already starting to feel the mental sharpness. And so I'm doing, you know, research on this and you guys know me, if I get into something, I get into it. Right. So I'm reading about, you know, ketogenic effects on cognition and there's definitely some benefits. And part of the, the, the benefits of that type of diet for the people that have been tested or for, for some studies, not all studies, but for some studies, is the the energy production uh, in the, in the brain and how the brain uses energy? It seems mm-hmm. to be, and they find this pretty consistently with people who have dementia and Alzheimer's. So when you mm-hmm. take someone with Alzheimer's, put them on a ketogenic diet, or you have somebody who's you know uh, dementia and raise their ketone levels, they tend to think a little bit sharper. Yeah, what's up with that? With the, the brain functioning, uh, it seems like more optimally on ketones. Do you think it's because it's a, it's like a slower process versus something like the oversaturation of glucose? It's a cleaner burning energy. Right, like, a, the, like a slower, cleaner process, right? It's um, it, not necessarily slower, although for physical performance, it's definitely slower. So like if you're on a ketogenic diet, uh, you guys know this, and you're going to do like low level intensity but long duration, it's actually a great diet for that. You know, like if I'm going to go do uh, a long hike without food, I, going into it already in ketosis is, a, is probably a good thing for, for, for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But for other types of performance, explosive performance, strength or whatever, 
you're going to lose strength. You're not going to perform. You're not going to be as explosive. It's not a great athletic diet uh, right. for most people. But for the brain, it just it's a cleaner burning energy. And one of the things that happens to people as they age is that their brains start utilizing glucose uh, not as effectively. In fact, they call Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes. Mm -hmm. So when you switch off of glucose, now you're using a different kind of energy and you're kind of bypassing why your brain, you know, some of the some of the, the the problems with the, your aging brain, and so you tend to think a little sharper. So this led me down a, a, a just a whole uh, you know rabbit hole of, of ATP and ADP, and all that stuff, right? Yeah. So Back I started reading about cycle. yeah, ATP for example is I mean that's like one of the main sources of energy for uh, the entire body. It's uh, it's an extremely important part of the human body and. You know, uh, it's found in all forms of life. So it's like, it's a main source of energy uh, for all sources of life. It's, uh, they, all, they, all, they often refer to it as molecular unit of currency of intracellular energy transfer. So it's extremely, extremely important. So I'm like, huh, what are some of the most effective ways to maximize ATP uh, production? Creatine, obvious. Mm -hmm. Taking creatine, I take creatine on a consistent basis. But this is why they find that creatine works so well uh, for other uh, health effects aside from just performance. They're finding it's got cognitive boosting effects, antioxidant effects, anti-aging effects. So I'm like, okay, I know about creatine. What else is an effective way to get the body to in increase its ATP uh, production? Red light therapy. Oh, red, wow. red light Ooh. therapy. And you this is another benefit. Yeah, this is one of the main uh, uh, reasons that they think it works in the first place. Like, why does, for example, um, I'll give you a couple examples. Two things where there's a lot of promises with products and very, very little uh, actual results uh, hair regrowth and removal of wrinkles. Like, there's a shit ton of products out there that promise to regrow hair, shit ton of products that promise to reduce the, the appearance of wrinkles or whatever. Very few things deliver. In particular, with hair regrowth, there's like, you know, minoxidil, I think, is one of the pro things that actually might work. And red light therapy. Red light therapy, actually. And they think the reason why it works is when you shine this type of light. The kick up of the ATP. Yes, it, it dramatically increases ATP. Interesting. And this is also why it reduces the appearance uh, of wrinkles. So I'm like, okay, so you guys, again, I get into shit, right? So I'm like, all right, hmm. fasting, ketogenic diet, already taking creatine got my juve light out and I'm like, I'm going to start using this every single day because I want to reverse this. Like I said, this feeling of, you know, fogginess or whatever. I'm with you the same. I love, That's cool. I, I'm not, I'm not on the ketogenic diet, but I love after, um, a trip like that, I'll do like a nice 24 hour fast and then I'll mm -hmm. kickstart like eating. And for me, all I, the way I do it is I start with a fast, then I go back to eating. And when I'm eating, I'm I'm just eliminating, like, I mean, shit, I allowed candy in there. I allowed dessert in there. I allowed a lot of <coughs> snacking in there. I just get rid of all the easy stuff right away for me to let go of. I'm not going to be mm -hmm. chomping on wheat thins in the middle of the day. I'm not going to be grabbing some Mike and Ikes while I'm watching Netflix later. And so I just eliminate the stuff that I know isn't serving my body very well. It's a great step. And and the fasting, though, is the is the big key, though, like you said, is I, I fast first. I feel like it just totally kind of cleans me out. And then when I reintroduce food, and this to me this is a, a, a more healthy relationship with fasting. I'm not doing it because I'm like, oh, I need to lose quick I'm weight. I'm so glad you said that. It's No, I'm just trying to reset my body. Yes, it's more of a, it's not, if you approach the fast, let's say you go on vacation or you, you, you've eaten really bad or whatever and you just haven't been super kind to your body and then you think, I'm going to fast so I can lose some weight real fast or whatever. Or, I'm going to fast so I don't eat. Terrible way to use fasting and what's going to do, it's going to encourage the restrict binge uh, behavior. The other way to uh, to approach fasting, which is what I think you're talking about, Adam, and the way I've my relationship with fasting is it's more of a spiritual practice. And the mm -hmm. spiritual practice being, I'm going to detach from food for a second. I'm going to I'm going to create a detachment where, um, and it's challenging, right? Because you just been eating garbage, so you fast, so you 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 become comfortable with the fact that you're not eating this stuff or eating anything. And then when you reintroduce food, you're you've got a better relationship with food. There's a very, very big difference between fasting as a spiritual, which is why fasting is present in all major religions. Yeah. It's a spiritual practice. But if you use it as a way to diet, that's just starving yourself. Yeah, I just feel there's times where where my gut's a little more agitated because I had been like introducing all these foods I know, uh, you know, make it work overtime. And to for me to kind of step away from that and allow, uh, you know, everything that's going on internally to kind of calm down. And then, yeah, you can use it uh, as a way to kind of reflect on other things as well. Like it's a much healthier practice. Yeah, and it's, you know, it makes me wonder too, because, uh, you know, you guys know January is like... Every 
everybody wants to work out, everybody wants to clean up their diet. And uh, I used to think, and I don't know why I didn't piece this together, it's probably less to do with the fact that the year's over and more to do with the fact that the holiday season's over. Right. And a lot yeah. of people feel that way, right? It is. No, I'm I mean, sure it's, everybody's it's crazy. Speaking of that, did you guys see our uh, Wally prediction is is coming true? Oh, you're talking about the Segway? Yes. Wait, did what? you see this? So no. you remember, when, I, this was probably, I don't know, six months or a year ago when Sal first brought up, I think, Wally, or you did, Justin, one of you did. And I hadn't watched it, so I went and watched Great it. Great cartoon. Oh, and yeah. you, and you, you guys made the point that. You know, we are moving in this direction. They how accurate accurate they predicted what our potential future may look like, where all these people are floating on these you know hovercrafts, where they're sitting and sucking on a Slurpee with a TV screen right, yeah, right in front of them. And so Segway has, and it's funny. You know, it's funny. I someone shared with me before. Uh, uh. So Jackie sent this article over, and I had already seen. The way, segway. way to go, Segway. My best friend sent the Segway over, but he didn't send the article over. And I go, oh my God, the Wally prediction is, is <laughs> correct. And then Jackie sent over this morning an article and they actually referenced the Wally in it. And I was like, mm. oh, that's so crazy because we talked about this. But So dude, it's basically a chair that tra- travels around for you, like the Segway, but you sit in it. Yeah. yeah. Is it going to have connections? It looks, it looks like mean, a big car for people seat. that are like, you know, impaired, like <laughs> they can't walk, or is this like supposedly marketed to just- Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Brilliant invention. I'm not the me. Yeah, I mean, for people that can't walk, right? Me bringing this up is not a to slam Segway by any means. It's just this. I mean, how do you think it starts? It starts with probably people who absolutely need it, right? And then then it turns into rascal scooters. Well, yeah, and then exactly. Then eventually you get in and you're like, oh, this is kind of cool and nice. I can just kind of tilt back and it takes me wherever I want to go. Especially if it's connected to like you know devices and Wi Fi. If it's not, if it's not, it will be. Yep. You know what I'm saying? If it's It's, so, I went to. Disney World years ago, probably like seven or eight years ago. Uh, have you guys ever been to Disney World? Okay. Uh, I've been once, yeah, okay, to okay. the world, not the okay. land. It, it scared the shit out of me. There were traffic jams of of, of those rascal scooters. Yeah. Traffic jams. Because so many, and, and the vast majority of these people were not uh, like handicapped in terms of, you know, they had full use of their oh, arms. Just obese. Just massive. Yeah. yeah. They were just huge people. And they were, and I remember we'd be in line and there'd be like, 15 scooters in front of us and like Whoa. yeah that never happened i remember and, and it's always like at the end of the ride because they can come up through the back you know mm-hmm. of there and then they get to you know to sit, sit in the front but it's like yeah dude it's crazy how like how many you see now dude i saw one where there was this woman and she was i mean you know, a good 350 pounds and she's on the scooter and her daughter is sitting on her like her belly and her daughter was very overweight four-year-old with a huge, like one of those huge, like the biggest big gulps, big gulps full of soda, just drinking, and she's just driving around, and I just like, oh my. You heart. know, you know, they make those like gallon size now, yeah, right? I, know. I remember oh, when I was a kid. Man. That's so and much sugar. Do you remember? I, you remember? I remember when the big gulp was invented. Yeah, like, the know. big gulp, and then they had the double gulp. I which was, that was a big deal. Which it was all it was was I think thirty two ounces back then. Yeah, it was which was crazy. Yeah, how many grams of sugar is in that? Oh, like two hundred? No, way more than that. It's a, oh gosh. Wait, that's insane. Doug, look up what the, the they have a super big gulp now. Now, which is a gallon. No, uh, it's not. Yes. It's got a handle, right? I took a picture of it. I've seen like, that. A gallon? Yeah, like five, six years ago. I posted on my Instagram a long time ago. When, <laughs> uh, the first time I saw one at 7-Eleven. Uh, it's, it's got a handle like this, and it is a, a, a jug. Yeah, and it's like this. I don't know what it's called. But it's the the highest level of the the super. The, I mean, there's so there's like the big gulp, so the super bad. big gulp, the super duper big gulp. Like there's like so many levels to that, it. You know what's what's crazy about that? And this is when when people say like, oh, food doesn't have addictive properties, and there aren't these whatever. It's like it makes me laugh because like don't how, do you have eyes? Yeah, do you not see? I have it's in front of you. I have trained many people who many people like 100 percent guarantee you guys are gonna be like, oh yeah, I heard that all the time, where they didn't like the taste of water. Yeah. I don't know. I don't like water. It doesn't yeah, taste good. Bleh. What do you mean it doesn't taste good? Yeah. It's water. It's refreshing. And, and yeah. why does this happen? Because you're, how many grams of sugar is that, Doug? Good. What does that say? 156 carbs. Let's see. That's only sugar? the that's only the 44 ounce. You got to find the big one, Doug. Okay. Oh, my yeah. God. 156 look, look grams of sugar. The, look up the biggest Oof. big gulp or whatever. I don't know what you're going to Google for it. I'm, I'm going to try and help you here. The biggest... The biggest big gulp. Maybe. That's crazy, dude. I remember vividly, like my brother and my dad would fill up those double <laughs> gulps uh, of like uh, cherry coke, and I was always like, "Wow, that's so much sugar, dude!" And it was like not even a thought uh, back then. It was just like, "Oh, this is just you know, this is a beverage." That's crazy. It's yeah, called. There's a. There's okay. Listen. There's a. A the the big gulp 
the super big gulp, the double, the double gulp, the extreme gulp, and then came in 2006 came the team gulp. Team, team, <laughs> team gulp. Yeah. So there's an extreme. So you, you don't feel so Doug, bad about Doug, ordering. There's an extreme gulp, and then there's hey guys, a, a, a team, a team gulp. You're just gonna gulp. Yeah. So like, like you don't feel so bad about ordering it. Like, oh yeah, this is for me and my team. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. But again, I, I had clients who didn't like the taste of water because they drink soda so often yeah. that they literally did not water. I had a client once tell me water made her uh, nauseous. <laughs> water made you nauseous. <laughs> you that's, that's a problem. It's like, yeah, it's like the one thing your body needs. Yeah, it's like, uh, it's like saying, I don't like air. Yeah, there exactly. it is right there on the left yeah. right there. Oh my God, look at that thing. That's insane. Oh, they have sugar cubes next to it to show. This you. is why when you told me that so that gross. was it, Coke had you, you were telling us had a monthly plan. You said it was unlimited. I was like, no way. Yeah. They would lose well, so the, much aren't money. These, aren't these refillable? Is that how it works? I don't, I don't know how these how they work. How, does it, can you come back and refill them? Is that when you pay the top? Oh bill? yeah, I'm sure. Oh yeah, you gosh. just bring them back, that's, fill it up. That's so insane. Oh, it is. Yeah. Anyway, I wanted to tell you guys about. I just remembered. So a uh, couple couple weeks ago. Jessica and I, have you guys seen the billboards? I mean, you have to have. They're everywhere. <laughs> the billboards that have said, um, they say Shin Yun on them, and it shows like a Chinese oh, dancer. Is that like a, what is that called? The Cirque du Soleil kind of a It looks event? like that. Yeah. It, Doug, pull up, uh, pull up Shin Yun, and I want to see. I want them to see the picture. I 100% guarantee you've seen billboards because they're everywhere. You were talking about this, but you never told me what it was. No, no. Look up the look up the picture. You'll see what it looks like. So oh, it says see. right there, performing. So, Oh, yeah, have okay. you seen those? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's got like a Chinese dancer and they've got like the nice dress and the amazing lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've seen it everywhere, right? And I, you know, Jessica loves uh, performance art type stuff. Of course. My parents love that. Um, uh, Jessica, of course, because she traveled with Cirque du Soleil for so long. Yeah. And I, I enjoy, I enjoy seeing the, 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 the types of physical abilities people can accomplish when they train for years and years. So for Christmas, I thought, oh, this would be a great present for my parents. So, and again, I've, I don't know anything about it. All I know is I've seen a ton of billboards, and it looks like it's going to be like a Cirque du Soleil type of thing. Sure. And then, so I buy tickets, right? I buy tickets for my parents. The date comes up. We all go to it. When we get there, now that I'm actually there and we're waiting for the show to start, we get there early. I'm like, let me look up the history of, of Shen Yun. And I read up, and it says, uh, banned in China. So now I'm like, huh? Banned in China? Yeah, so now I'm like really interested. I'm like, oh, cool. I like that part. Let's Ooh. see what's going on here. <laughs> so I read more about it. Will they still have like bind feet and all that? Or no, like, is it bro. Crazy? No. So I watched, as I'm watching the show, there is a very strong religious undertone to this whole thing. Oh, interesting. Like they'll do the performances and then in between there'll be like one where there's like an angel coming down from heaven and they bow to it. And then they have like uh, these these plays, these like like scenes where there's Chinese communists, you know, beating the crap out of them, and then they come back and they dance, and then they, you know, show oh. them this magic book, which is obviously their religious so it's like social commentary. Where, so I read about it, and so it's this religious group in China that is like super religious, and you know, as you guys know, communism doesn't like any kind of religion because no. you don't want anything above, you know, uh, the, the state. Yeah, the state or whatever. But they're kind of culty, so I'm not like advocating for them, and I don't know a whole lot about them. But what I read was a little bit kind of culty or whatever. Uh -huh. They got persecuted, thrown in jail. Some of the, many of them murdered in China, banned. Wow. Their leader came to America and started this dance show or whatever, and in a way to spread. And so what's funny is I'm reading reviews about this show. The negative reviews are all the, the the people who are surprised by the political commentary. They're like, I came to watch a dance show. I didn't come here to see <laughs> like you know angels coming down and weird shit or whatever. So it was interesting. It was very interesting. It was an interesting show. But again, if you did, you like it or what was your take on it? I enjoyed it, but you got it. Was it really heavy on the political side? Uh, the religious undertones were pretty strong, dude. Oh, they were. Yeah, but but yeah. if you get around that, and I don't really care, whatever, do your thing, preach it. They weren't preaching bad message. The messages were good from what I saw. It was like unity and taking care of each other. But there were parts where, again, they were like holding the magic book and then, you know, the angels and all that kind of stuff. But if you can just get around that, watch the actual dancing and the performance, it was spectacular. It was did did Jessica like it? Jessica liked it too. Okay. Yeah, she definitely enjoyed it. But it was uh, it was uh, interesting, well, kind of yeah. interesting. Anyway, another thing uh, I wanted to bring up. Um, so uh, along the lines of inflammation, and I was talking about that earlier, I also went down the rabbit hole of, of looking up uh, uh, cannabinoids. You guys know I'm always really interested in... Oh, you've been on the, the CBC kick for a while. Yes, now. yes. So CBC, uh, you know, I got more information on uh, it's cannabichromine. And I like reading about other cannabinoids because we tend to think that all there is is THC and CBD. Yeah. And the other cannabinoids, you know, they don't really do anything. That's what a lot of people think. 
But uh, the other cannabinoids are fascinating, and some of them might even be more interesting than um, CBD, for example. So CBC doesn't bind very well to the CB receptors, the ones that like THC will bind to, but it does bind to two other receptors. One's called TRPV1, and another one's called TRPA1. And both of these are linked to pain perception. And so what happens is when CBD, this is what's real cool, when CBC attaches to these receptors, what happens to the body is it actually increases its own natural levels of uh, endocannabinoids. Endocannabinoids are cannabinoids your body makes naturally, like uh, anandamide. So CBC doesn't give you the cannabinoid effects of like, let's say THC, but what it does do is it makes your body make its own natural, more natural endocannabinoids, and it increases circulating levels of them. Hmm. So what does this mean? Well, it means that you can use something like CBC and not get this uh, this strong down-regulating effect like you'll get with THC. Like what you'll notice with THC is you use THC, and then you need more and more of it to get the same effect to the point where I know stoners who use, geez, you know, 20 grams, 30 grams of, uh, of, of THC, and that for them that feels normal because they use it so often. CBC makes your body utilize its own natural cannabinoids, so it's probably a better cannabinoid to focus on for people who just want – Hmm. Health effects don't want to get high or whatever. Well, again, again, it sounds like you're making the case for full spectrum versus what a lot of right. people are doing is isolating one of the compounds. Yes, they're trying to concentrate and and find those like specific can cannabinoids. 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 Yeah, no, you're 100 percent right because what we do in Western medicine that's both good and bad is we'll identify an active ingredient mm -hmm. and then we'll fucking concentrate it and eliminate everything else instead of thinking right. hmm, there might have been a reason they why pair it was well found, together and it's found it's in nature powerful. this way. Yes, yeah. yeah, so like acute effects. So so if you want acute, like you have a strong, let's say you're, you know, you've got cancer and you need some strong shit to really kill the pain. You still want to use all the cannabinoids, but you probably want a lot of THC. Yeah. You probably want a lot of THC to do that. But let's say you're the average person and you're like, huh, I want to utilize cannabinoids for their just general balancing effect. Because that's what they do. They balance the body. They balance pain. They balance anxiety. They help with memory formation and forgetting, which is important. Your brain's ability to forget information is an important part of you actually remembering important information. So how do you balance that out? Well, one of the best ways you do it is you utilize the full spectrum of cannabinoids. Mm. And you probably don't want a lot of THC, which is like a hammer. You know, that's the thing that makes you feel the high or whatever. Mm -hmm. So full spectrum, you know, uh, hemp oil extract, for example, is, is a great way, way to go. Like Ned. Ned yeah. And in fact, Ned, if you ask them, they'll, you can see third party testing and it'll, it, they actually test all the cannabinoids, not just CBD. CBD. Mm -hmm. So you'll see, oh, CBC, CBG, uh, you know, they'll see the terpenes, all that stuff. So it's really cool. So inflammation from a different direction. Did you guys see uh, uh, Ricky Gervais's, uh, his speech he did for the Golden Globes? Oh, oh was, yes. It was so I sent that over. I don't know if you boy, guys watched that it. Was, did that just happen? Yes. That, that was, just happened like yesterday. Love, oh, it did. Did you yeah. watch it live or did someone send uh, that to you? Yeah. So Courtney watched it live and then I, I saw people like posting about it and then I was like, what? What, what was it? And I Dude, went back and watched raw. it. Dude, like he just eviscerated like Hollywood, uh, the corporations. Like he just went all out. I couldn't believe it, dude. Can you feel what's it was amazing? Can you feel what's happening yes. with Hollywood? No, it's we're, they're we're, losing their power. Well, and not only that, but we're also watching with comedy. We're starting to push back on yeah. the like sensitive. They're like, we're done with this woke shit. Yes, like we're we're done. Like he went so hard against it. Like I, I was like, I wanted to stand up and applaud. You know, and just be like, just the bravery of him, just like getting up there well, and like saying all that. It was probably we were probably due to go on this, you know, this kick for a while now of you know being ultra sensitive. Which, by the way, you know, when I talked about. Uh, I brought up my family in the thread over Thanksgiving and the political comment. Yeah. I got heat for that. Oh. From who? Uh, from w one of my cousins that heard it. And I, and I, I got to go back and listen to it because one, I didn't say anybody's name. And then two, uh, you know, I, I don't I don't. It remember. was probably the cousin you were arguing with. Well, no, it wasn't oh. actually. It was another one that was just coming to uh, her defense and everything. And I thought, oh. well, did I say something that was really like uh, harsh? I was just, I was making the point that I, it's unfortunate that we try to censor everything so much that we shut it down versus like, you know, and we talked about the importance of like a jester and comedy and yep, memes yep. and everything like that. And that, 
you know, it doesn't need to be a, an argument and a fight over it. It can be, it can be funny yeah. and bring comical. it to light. Right. And yes. so I feel like we're seeing that now in comedy again, where they were, they freaked out for oh, yeah. about a decade there where they were getting, you know, pushed out like, of college. Oh, by the way, uh, Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself. I was yeah, like, oh, yeah. oh, dude. Bro, Hollywood is, I'm going to generalize now. I'm sure, of course, there's, there's people who stand out, but Hollywood is a sea of hypocritical, virtue signaling, fake ass people. Now, for those of you listening who think, oh, that's not true, they're actors. Yeah. The, the, they are the best people in the They win awards for acting. A hunt, and don't think for a second that they don't know how to act in a way that makes you like them. Mm -hmm. Think about this. How many actors do you think are great people? And then how many of those same people do you know personally? I bet you you think a lot of them are great. And I bet you know none of them in person. So like a good example is Tom Hanks. Seems like a fucking great guy. I don't know the guy in person, right. but he's extremely likable in the way he's acting. Right. And that's what they do really well. So here's some great examples. Oh, of Bill Cosby, Amy Bill, Bill Cosby like has to be one of the greatest examples of that. Bill Cosby, one of the most liked people in the world, and yet the dude was a fucking terrible predator. scumbag predator. Yeah. And so this is what Hollywood is full of, a bunch of fake... So when they come up and they do their speeches and their talks and their... They don't live in the same world that we do. What they're trying to do is sound likable. They're trying mm -hmm. to sound like... Well, they're the pushing agendas all over the place. Yeah, like like uh, my favorite person to pick on is Leonardo DiCaprio and his like super, I'm super pro-planet and, you know, whatever. Yacht, private jet, massive, you know, mansions. Like, look at their actions. Don't listen to their words. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening is I think Hollywood is losing their power. I really, and I appreciate that. I'm glad because they shouldn't have power to in the first place. They should entertain us, but they should not have any power because these people... They don't know anything aside from being phenomenal at entertaining us. Right. First question is from Ms. Adams224. Why is it so hard for people to stick to their health and fitness goals? Oh, mm. uh, because they're goals. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, it, it, it is. It's true. It, it disciplines. It, because it's goals. And, be, and how do we get to our goals? The way we get to goals is through discipline and willpower. There's nothing wrong with those two things. But when it comes to health and fitness... Going off of willpower, you will fail at some point because willpower just doesn't last all the time. Mm. The people who stick to their health and fitness, quote unquote, goals are people who it's, it's, it's a part of their lifestyle. It's not a goal. It's not like I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to do this. And then what do I do when I lose this willpower? What do I do when I lose this discipline? What do I do when I become weak? It's a different relationship with uh, nutrition and exercise. I also think it's I think it's the way we set our goals. Like I think we set such lofty, extreme goals. And they've I read an article a, a long time ago that referenced this with just like success or period or telling your kids like you can be anything you want to be. Mm -hmm. You know, if, and that's there's a lot. Of, there's a, a lie. lie. It is a lie. <laughs> it's that's, totally a lie. But how long have we heard that? And it's been it's been passed along. Said like it's not true. And the same thing to be said about people that set fitness goals they set very unrealistic goals to set off start off and it's like why would you do that when there's so many steps uh, before that that are great goals mm -hmm. and i think this is something that took years probably a decade of of training clients before i really pieced this together and that was client comes in and and you know they're you know morbidly obese super overweight 100 pounds plus overweight and they have this image or they watch the biggest loser and so they're like oh i want to be here and mm -hmm. it's this huge goal and I know, to your point, Sal, that if this is going to be a lifelong behavior, that I can't just push them to that goal. I've got to give them the tools and I got to slowly give them, like you give them a tool and you practice that tool for a while and you get good at using it. Then you give them another tool, you practice with that tool, you get good at it. And over time, you eventually have all these these tools in your tool belt that you can, you can use at your disposal to make this a long-term successful journey for yourself where... Right now, I think when it's the beginning of the year, a lot of people overshoot these lofty goals and they end up getting burnout. Totally. Yeah, yeah you're, you're basically developing these micro habits that, that build up confidence. And, and these confidence, like once, once they feel like they've accomplished like one thing, that's something they can build upon and, and then they find enjoyment in that. I think that a lot of times like we need to really find enjoyment, uh, you know, in, in self-improvement and finding like a way to make that happen because then it's like it can become a lifestyle thing. It's not going to become a lifestyle thing begrudgingly. Right. And I think that that's that's a mistake uh, a lot of people make. It's like, I, I have to beat myself up to get to a certain place. But, you know, yeah, there's struggle. Of course there's struggle. But, you know, you finding uh, enjoyment in, in a portion of that is everything. It's all in how you approach it. It really is. So if you're going into this thinking, uh, I want to look this way. I, I have this this fitness goal. 
I want to lose this much weight. Um, if, and you don't have long-term permanent behaviors already set around fitness and health, the odds that you fail are astronomically high. Astronomical. I would say nine out of 10 of you uh, listening right now, if you approach it that way, long-term, you're going to fail. Instead, try approaching it this way. Say to yourself, okay, I'm going to make permanent lifestyle changes. Now, why does that make a big difference? Because you're going to approach it completely different. If I walk into a gym for the first time in years or ever, and I say to myself, I'm going to make permanent lifestyle changes, I'm going to start slow. I am because I, now I know this is going to be forever. So I'm going to go into the gym and be like, well, I'm working out zero days a week and I'm going to do something that I'm going to do forever. I think I'm going to start once a week. Right. Let me start once a week and see what that looks like. Or I'm going to change my, I got to you know get better with my nutrition, but I got to do it in a permanent way. And nutrition, by the way, is a harder harder one to change than, yeah. than exercise because nutrition is just, it's a part of who we are. It's a part of culture. It's, it's, culture, a, part, yeah, it's a part of everything that you pretty much do. Think, you know, Culture and society surrounds itself and, and circulates around food. So when you think to yourself, I'm going to change how I eat, that's a massive, massive change. Now add to the sentence, I'm going to change how I eat forever. Oh boy, let's start slow. Changing anything forever makes you want to start slow. So you think, okay, I'm going to do this forever. First thing I'm going to do is uh, I think I'm going to eat you know, a, a serving of vegetables twice a week because I don't eat any at all right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do that for a while. Then when it becomes a part of your permanent life, then you add the next change. And now if you're listening and you're thinking to yourself, wow, that's just going to take too long. That sounds like I'm, I'm motivated right now. Remember this, okay? Permanence is much better than temporary, okay? So will it take you longer? Yeah, but you'll keep it. There's nothing worse than getting somewhere and getting out of somewhere. And um, losing it. Oh, that's a, that's a terrible uh, position to be in. And it doesn't take as long as you think. Look, I've used this uh, example many, many times, uh, and I like the way it illustrates uh, what we're talking about. If you took two parallel lines and I adjusted one a fraction of a degree to the left, that's it, just a fraction of a degree, Looking at it initially doesn't even look like it looks like they're still parallel. Follow those lines. The further along, you, the further you follow those lines, the further apart they become. The more they diverge. So this is what ends up happening when you approach this with that particular mentality. It starts off slow for sure, but trust me, over the course of just a year or two, you make some fundamental changes that won't go away. The the irony of this this doesn't change just because you're more advanced or you've been doing this for a long time. Uh, we just talked earlier in the episode of how we start uh, after coming back from vacation. Like right. That. You know, this is uh, two weeks. I did not lift and eat really well. Two weeks. It's probably the longest in a very long time, uh, probably since my injury, where I actually had two solid weeks off and not eating very well. And I'm coming back. Now, two weeks for a lot of people isn't that long time. Many people have taken months off over the entire holidays. And yet I still will come back very, very slow. So what it'll look like this week is starting off with a fast. And then again, like I said, I'm not going to go hardcore dieting anything. It's just I'm going to get rid of the stuff I know doesn't belong in my diet and make a conscious effort to make a, a better balanced meals. That And then maybe get in the gym two or three times this week. That in itself will already set me up in the right direction and it's not too much to commit. And it falls in line with what I'm always constantly saying on the show, which is I'm always trying to do the least amount possible to elicit the most amount of change. And when you haven't been doing anything for several weeks, eating wise, healthy and or exercise, it doesn't take very much for the body to respond and start seeing some change. Right. And in, in going through this process from a permanence uh, mentality, a lifestyle, a forever, go into it and think to yourself, can I do the changes I'm going to do right now? Can I keep them forever? And you got to be honest with yourself. Okay. Remember, you're, you're, you're coming from a motivated standpoint which means that you're not going to be motivated at other times. So ask yourself, because right now you might be motivated. You might be super motivated, like a lot of people in January. So ask yourself, so, okay, can I do this forever? And can I keep this up when I'm not motivated? I know I'm motivated right now and I'm excited, but am I going to be able to keep this up when I'm not motivated? So you have to be very honest. And that may look like a very small change. It literally may look like, and I've started many clients who've achieved lifelong permanent success as long as I've known them. I've started a lot of them with once a week once a week in the gym. And I've actually convinced people. People have come up, come to hire me, have not worked out for 10 years or longer, or whatever. And they've said to me, I want to start working out with you three days a week. And I've actually convinced them and said, actually, let's start once a week. Let's do that for now. And we have this big talk, like just like I'm doing right now on the podcast. And those people accomplished phenomenal things. So be very honest with yourself. What can you do forever? Now, what does this do for you? Well, over time, you will value health and fitness 
uh, you would truly value it in, in different ways. Now, what does that mean? That means that when you value health and fitness in a real way, you do it even when you don't enjoy it. Okay, that's an important thing to understand. When you're motivated and having fun, nobody has to convince you to exercise and eat right. When you're having a good time and you're super motivated, you don't need, there's no problem. Mm -hmm. Nobody needs help when they're motivated. When people need the help is when they lose motivation, like we all do. When they lose the enjoyment factor, you know, waking up, you don't feel like moving, you'd rather watch TV, you'd rather eat, you know, junk food, you're stressed out or whatever. That's the times when the true value comes out. So when you build these lifestyle, these lifelong habits slowly over time, you value it to the point where, you know, when I go through hard times in my life, I don't go to the gym to work out to get stronger and have fun. I use it as a way to relieve stress. I use it as a way to make myself feel better. When I'm stressed out uh, and anxious and I want to, you know, eat, reach for a piece of cake, I actually value my health and fitness to the point where I know my anxieties actually do better long term if I eat healthy. And so that's when you, that's how you accomplish that, that permanent. So the ma the reason why it's so hard for people is they're going in with goals and it's about motivated motivation, inspiration. That is a hundred percent, uh, a road to uh, failure in the long term. Burnout. Next question is from dance girl. What are the benefits of isometric holds? For example, a wall sit, you know, it's funny with isometric, uh, type. So if you don't know what that means, so there's there's three main types of muscle contractions. There's the concentric contraction. This is when I'm actually lifting something. So think of a bicep, right? Me curling a weight up, that's concentric. Me lowering the weight, that's another form of contraction that's called eccentric. And then there's holding something that's isometric. And it's funny because uh, or ex there's the isometric holds go in and out of favor in the in the fitness space. Both that and eccentric. I they think. do. I think both those two are overlooked. But yeah. isometric a lot. Like isometric was valued a lot a long time ago. Uh, wrestlers and you know grapplers and when weight training became a thing initially in the early days of lifting weights. Yeah. Isometrics was a big was a big thing. The Soviets uh, really utilize isometric training quite a bit. In fact, they have some of the best studies on isometric training. I love isometric training because they create little da damage for the amount of uh, the amount of results you get from them. So it's a great way to add volume to your mm -hmm, workout mm -hmm. without overtraining your body. Um, the strength that you gain from an isometric hold, most of it's in the in the hold itself, but there's a lot of carryover to outside of that. Well, it's position. also one of the best ways to to teach how to get connected to a muscle. Totally, right? we talk about a muscle connection, mind muscle connection. People throw that term around a lot. You know, this is one of the best ways to help somebody get connected. There is, you know, in a wall sit. You know what's cool about a wall sit is you can be in a wall sit and there's there's many muscles that are being contracted, but you can sit in it and actually mentally engage the ones that you want to put more emphasis yeah. on. Mm -hmm. So I could be in a wall sit and I can make it really quad, you know, and just totally tense up my quads. Or I can kind of shift it back into my glutes and squeeze and tense my glutes to hold me up in that That's position. That's what I like about it. It allows for the time for you to really connect and feel your way through, uh, the, you know, the muscles and into the recruitment process. So it's like, you know, can I summon up more of an army, you know, for for this job that I have? And that's, that's part of it. Like you can do it from like any angle too, which is a great benefit to it. So if there's a part of an exercise you feel like you don't have that much support, you don't have that much strength yeah. in Yes, good point. Let's just let's just focus on that for a while. Let's feel our way through it. Let's squeeze and, and see if we can recruit more, so we get more powerful in, in that movement. No, and that's, that's it's a perfect exercise. That's for that. a great uh, great point. So to, to use that as an example, let's say you're you you like to squat, but you notice at the bottom of your squat you tend to lose a little bit of stability. Your knees wobble a little bit, or your your pelvis tilts, or you just don't feel as connected. A great way to connect to that portion of the rep is to do an isometric hold in that portion of the rep. We did a great YouTube video on this. Mm -hmm. We did it. It's a Dumphy squat. And mm -hmm. I know uh, Justin introduced that to us for that exact reason that you're talking about right now, Sal. And I think it's one of the most overlooked. Here's what you got to remember is like, we and we tend to do this. <coughs> we do an exercise, we do something and it's like, we want the immediate results. Like tomorrow, why was I not sore enough? Or, oh, I didn't see something change. It's like, that's not what you're doing when you do something like that. Like if you go squat, 200 pounds 10 times and then you go do isometric holds for 10 reps you're going to feel the squat with 200 pounds on your back way more the next day it doesn't necessarily mean though that the the isometric hold couldn't be as beneficial for somebody if you're not 
getting good recruitment in your glutes and you're trying to focus on that, just loading the bar up however it just gets the body sore doesn't necessarily mean that you're use, utilizing the glutes as much as you'd like to. Yeah. So introducing these types of exercises, it's the long-term carryover that you're getting, it, that which is great because it seems to be it's, the theme of this episode is the you know you're doing something very small and basic but the carryover that it will have long term for you is going to be tremendous it's the first place you go when you have disconnection the mm -hmm. first place you go when you can't connect to a muscle well is to try to squeeze it in an isometric uh, position you know what western athletes uh understood the benefits of isometrics on accident before other athletes bodybuilders Mm. Now you ask, well, how? How bodybuilders don't use isometric holds? Posing. They flex. Yeah. That's exactly right. And I remember as a kid stumbling upon this on accident. Because when I was a kid and I was lifting weights in the 90s, I, no magazines talked about isometric holds. But they did talk about the benefits of flexing and posing. They never used the word isometric, but they would say things like, Arnold, you know, when he would go up to, as he got closer to competition, he would spend an hour a day posing and bodybuilders would say, yeah, it helps bring out definition or whatever, you know, gym bro, you know, science. Or, so I would practice flexing because of course Arnold did it and he's, you know, the bodybuilding God or whatever. And I would notice when I would practice more flexing, I feel better in my workouts. I would just be able to feel the muscles a little bit more. Um, and by the way, if you've never posed or flexed your muscles and held them, I'm not talking about just to flex and relax. Try holding a pose like a bodybuilder does on stage. I mean, when you're on stage as a bodybuilder and you're holding a front double bicep, you have to hold it and look good. Not just your biceps, you're flexing everything in a very nice, you know, you have to and look And increase really, the intensity of it. And you have to smile while you're doing it. You can't mm. look like, you're, ah, you know, because that takes away from the look or whatever. And you're holding that shit for like 30 seconds. No. Try doing that. No joke. Try five minutes of posing where you're holding a flex. And remember, your whole body's getting looked at. So you're not just doing a lat spread or, uh, you know, a, a crab pose. The whole, the whole body's being presented. Try flexing your whole body in different poses. Hold your pose for, just hold it for 15 seconds. Just do that. Do that for five minutes and tell me that, that that's not a freaking amazing workout. Next question is from Kim and Lexi Adventures. Can you explain why fit people have a lower resting heart rate and why it's important? It's a muscle. <clears throat> you made it stronger by exercising it. You're, you're just more efficient. Yeah. Your, your body is utilizing the blood that it's pumping more efficiently. Um, so you don't, your heart doesn't need to pump as much. Your, your heart is also pumping more effectively. So yeah, more the blood. Goal of the body. You know, there's some people that theorize that we are all born with a, a maximum time that our heart will beat like 100 trillion times. Oh, it only has like X amount of beats. Chinese medicine. Right. There, yeah. There's, mm. there, there's, there's the people that theorize that each of us were born with this. You are, you've got a hundred trillion beats, whatever. I'm just saying that for yeah. hypothetical reasons. That's what right? I always call it the ticker. Right? And by you strengthening your heart, because it's a muscle, you can build it just like you could build the biceps and, and exercise it. And what Sal means by efficient, it just, it takes less pumps to like, let's say when you're unhealthy, your heart rate takes 60 pumps in a minute to circulate blood through the body. Well, if it's a really strong heart, it no longer takes 60. It takes 50 or 40. Yeah, well, 60 would be low to begin with. If you're unfit, yeah. you right, probably... Right, right yeah. yeah. No, yeah. those are terrible numbers I'm using. But to get the point across is that you know you, you need you use X amount per minute, whatever you you're start with. The more you train it, the more efficient it becomes. And that really matters over time. You know, it's less that muscle has to work throughout the entire day. You may be, and you may think, well, that's weird. You elevate it though when you exercise. Well, yeah, you elevate it for an hour. It's a stress. Right. That yeah. causes an adaptation. Right. That makes it more efficient and makes it stronger. And then the rest of the time you're alive, your your, your body's more efficient with its utiliz utilization of blood and the oxygen and nutrients that are in blood. So when you're out of shape and you go up a flight of stairs and your heart doof, 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 beating, it's because your body ain't utilizing oxygen and blood very well. It needs to pump more and more. Yeah, it's crazy. I was training like cyclists and a couple of marathon runners and to try and stress them out and to try and get their heart rate to exceed, you know, whatever max output they had previously was really difficult. They're, they're, they were so efficient, uh, you know, at bringing that level down. Even once it rose up high, it came right back down. And so that's, I mean, the, the more you train it, you know, the more effective it gets. That's a very good point right there. That's another benefit that you get from training the heart really well is the recovery time. Like, yes. Right. So like you, time Sal talked about walked up going like a, a person who's deconditioned, right? And we'll use better numbers now, like, you know, 75 or 80 beats per minute, their their heart beats to, right right now. They go upstairs and 120, it, 130. Yeah, it elevates to 120. And then for the next it's hard to get it down. The next 20 minutes, it's still above 100 because, oh my God, the flight of stairs, whew, that was a lot. Yeah. And the heart's still pumping. Yeah. The person who's really conditioned, well, first of all, they're already starting at 45 or 50 beats. They go up the stairs. It only goes up to like, 
like 80, and then it recovers right back down within minutes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That right there. And then when you think about it over you know, decades of your lifetime, you know, you, you now have saved so many, you know, pumps, you know, you're, if you think of your heart, like you're like an engine, like it's less miles that you're putting on that heart over time. And that's where I meant that. I know there's some people that theorize that you only get X amount of beats in your entire lifetime. One of the best ways to, you know, uh, uh, get that number to come down overall is by strengthening that's, it. So it doesn't have to be- and that's mainly a Chinese, I believe it's Chinese medicine that says, that. I know Western medicine, I, I don't know of any studies that support that, but Chinese medicine does say that, that, that specific thing that you just said. Adam, have you guys ever worked with uh, deep divers uh, who don't use like no. equipment or oh. whatever? Okay, so I've trained a couple uh, divers who that's what they do. They do competitions yeah, where they, they don't hold wear their breath like four minutes. Yeah, they Ab- don't. Abalone divers do this. Yeah, so they don't wear uh-huh. you know oxygen. It's just a freaking snorkel, and they go and dive the slowest heart heart rates you've ever measured in your entire life. Oh, As yeah. they're diving and holding their breath, their heart rate just doof, doof, just slows way, way down, and it's the most efficient thing I've ever seen on a human being. I actually mm. had somebody I trained years ago who competed that way, and he was able to get his... He was like, it's a heartbeat got so slow, it was like a freaking dolphin. Like, it was just... It wasn't even... It was, it was beating, like, I don't remember, it was like something ridiculous, a super low number. Pretty amazing to be able to do that. Now, what are the benefits of that? Well, shit, man. You want to talk about stamina, uh, being able to maintain, you know, a, a, a nice moderate level of intensity for long periods of time. Right. You know, that has its own, you know, health benefits. And achieving that state of calm. Yeah, but, but at the end of the day, look, to answer this question, it's just, you're just more efficient. It's like... You know, you're going to use less energy doing something that you're good at than you will doing something you're not good at. And if you're not good at moving your body, your body is very inefficient at using energy. It's going to use a lot more of it. Next question is from Ronert Nacho. Are inner thigh workouts bad for men? No, bad. Justin does it Romer all the time. Nacho. Yeah, well, Justin, <laughs> I love that Justin's name. a big inner thigh guy. I am. Guy. I'm a big inner thigh guy. I uh, do a lot of uh, good girls. Uh, <laughs> squeezy, squeezies. Yeah, squeezies. Yeah, no, of course they're beneficial. I mean, uh, and that's the thing too. Uh-huh. Like, you'll see you'll see how dominant you get over the years of patterns that you've established, uh, especially with athletics. And uh, to be able to stabilize, especially around the knee and ankles, like it's 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 essential that you're you're gonna you're gonna work the muscles in a way where it, where it keeps everything in track and it keeps everything in good alignment. And so to be able to you know train the inner thighs as a, in conjunction with the outer thighs and everything else uh, to to be more balanced is is optimal. It's so funny to me how body parts and exercises are you know start to get you know categorized as male or female. Now, I know part of the reason why is because when you ask men and women what body parts they want to work on, women more likely will say inner thighs and guys mm. more likely will say things like biceps and pecs. But the fitness space is fed into this. And, and, and now it's the point where a question like this pops up where it's, yeah, okay, more women want to do inner thigh workouts, but is that bad for men then? Should I not <laughs> do it? No, absolutely not. I There was a, a period in my life where I did a lot of you know, what you could categorize as inner thigh training. When I did, uh, when I was doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, a lot of the submissions and position, I mean, the guard position, for example, you need to not not just have good flexibility and mobility in your hips and in your inner thighs, but you also need to have a good squeeze. Yeah. You have to, and when you get an arm lock, especially if the guy picks you up or a triangle choke or, you know, lots of other submissions, part of the effectiveness of this of the submission is your ability to squeeze your legs together to trap your opponent. So when I was competing, I would do things like I definitely did the the, you know, uh, abduction, excuse me, adduction machine, which is the what Justin referred to as the bad good girl bad girl machine. That's where you put your legs on the sides and you squeeze them. But one thing that I did that I found very effective is I would take a medicine ball Put it between my legs yeah. and just isometric squat. I, so yeah. I'm going to make a case of why it can be bad for men and women uh, to do because it's really common that you know people you know <coughs> their feet pronate or collapse in. It's very common that you see knees caving in when oh, they yeah. squat. Yeah, if they're already doing that. And so if you're doing things like that, which is very common for both men and women when they're when they're squatting, you're the the femur's already internally rotating. You're already over dominant on the inner thigh, and if anything, you need to work the outside more than you need to work the inside. So. Uh, that's where it's bad. It's not yeah. bad because you're a man or a woman. If you have a breakdown mechanically in your legs and your feet are, mm-hmm. are flattening or pronating in, 
and you're and then the, which causes the femur to internally rotate and then you're also doing all these inner thigh exercises because you think you're trying to target an area to make it look a certain no, you're way. you're exaggerating the problem. Yeah, you're exaggerating the problem and you're making it worse. So there was very few clients that I ever did inner thigh direct work. In fact, um, it's more common to do outer. You're right. Yeah. It's more common to do outer and or do things that ha that stabilize the leg, right? So I like to do like a step up to a stabilization or a reverse lunge to a stabilization. And because you're having to stabilize, both the inner and the outer thigh have to kind of help work to stabilize the knee in that situation. I think too, a lot of lateral movement uh, for me, like that was a big one where, you know, your, your average person that's in the gym isn't even thinking about like adding in exercises that you move laterally in. So uh, to be able to stabilize the knee uh, left to right, uh, you know, that all like, engages those muscles anyways uh like like a lateral lunge or like a cossack squat or something like that where i'm you know i'm making sure that it, like i'm i can functionally uh, stabilize these forces with my body moving in those type of directions well this is why i like and this is how i you know, I know we cracked on stabilization exercise because we went on this kick for a long time but there there's value to it and here's a place where i see a lot of value because you take somebody and you have them this this person who comes to me and says, "Hey Adam, I want to work my inner thighs." Uh, but then I also notice that when they squat, their, their their knees are caving in, and we have this problem with the the feet pronating. Well, putting them in like a stabilization exercise, like a step up to a balance or a lunge to a balance, if your feet are collapsing and the knees collapsing in, you'll fall when you do a, an exercise where you have to stabilize on one leg. So it challenges them in that area. Meanwhile, also addressing the area they're asking you to to work on. So, you know, I much prefer doing something like that. That's why I'm not a fan of the good girl, bad girl type of machine uh, because of that. Because most people suffer from you know the flat feet, and I would much rather do something where they have to stabilize and balance on one leg, which then will not allow them to cheat and allow that knee to collapse in or the foot to flatten, or else you would fall over, and they have to really think about how they're grounded. Yeah, the only times I think you should target uh, inner or outer thighs is if you have identified an imbalance. So if, if you've identified a particular imbalance where the knee likes to travel one way or the other, mm -hmm. or there's a specific uh, sport or something that you're training for where you need extra lateral stability yeah. you or really need to crush watermelons between your thighs or yeah you know something like that yeah. right then then it kind of makes sense but other than that you know um besides correctional exercise purposes um or sports specific purposes i i, I rarely ever would program uh, inner or outer thigh specific exercises unless i'm correcting a problem they're not in there. I'm doing what Adam's talking about, stability exercises. We're doing unilateral movements. And then, of course, we're doing the big gross motor movements like squats and deadlifts and stuff like that. And you're going to get very well-balanced you know, leg development. Now, the inner and outer thigh muscles really act uh, mainly as stabilizers. Yeah. and they It's don't... just to keep you in good alignment. For that's right. Yeah. That's right. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our guides and resources. They cost nothing. We've got guides on squatting building your arms, getting a flatter midsection, fat loss, uh, a lot of guides, and they're all totally free. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin. You can find me at mindpumpsal and Adam at mindpumpadam.